Good evening and welcome back this evening. Good to see everyone back out with us tonight. It's cold out. It is cold. But it's warm in here and I'm glad of it. And uh, We are, are blessed to have a, a nice place to, to come, a nice place to meet. And it's good to see every one of you tonight. It's a, a blessing to gather and to assemble and sing. Um, appreciate our, our good song leaders that we have and uh, those that uh, lead from time to time. We're, we're blessed. We really are. Tonight's lesson is considering repentance. There's a, a uh, movie meme that I refer to sometimes, and it's um, The Princess Bride. And in that movie, one of the characters tells some of the other characters, he says, you keep using that word, but I don't think you know what it means. And I've used that reference quite a bit sometimes when I'm uh, in discussions with different things, when people use words and, or maybe misapply words or don't really know the complete meaning of words. So tonight, if we're going to understand and look and, as Christians, encourage one another unto godly repentance, we need to have an idea of what it is. And I think it's probably a misunderstood concept in Scripture. When we have people that have questions about whether or not they should repent, uh, and I frequently get uh, those types of conversations with people, is this something that I need to repent over? Is this something that I need to, you know, uh, go before the church? Is there, is there some um, schedule or some type of protocol? And there certainly is a different protocol set forth in Scripture, but under, if you understand completely the idea of repentance and what it means, it's not going to be covered in one lesson, of course, but we're going to touch on just a few things tonight. It will help each one of us when it comes a time in our life when we are what I call, and the Bible calls in Acts 2, pricked in our hearts, when, when the, the Spirit of the Lord, through knowledge and faith and study and the word of God that reveals through the word that there's something in your life that needs to be reconciled and that changes you, that causes you to have a, um, a feeling in your heart of, of sorrow. It's called godly sorrow. We're going to talk about that. That's called being pricked in your heart. When, when you're pricked in your heart and by means of knowledge and reason, you think that there's something that needs to be done. It's something that we need to act upon. And there are barriers to repentance. That's a different sermon for a different day, but there certainly are barriers that we um, have uh, in repentance. But tonight, as we look at repentance, I'm going to go over just a few passage, passages. Uh, and the main topic, or the main passage, is Acts chapter 3. Uh, and it's sometimes been called Peter's second sermon. Uh, of course, in the first sermon that Peter preached on Pentecost, he uh, gave the dialogue about the fulfillment of the kingdom being at hand and Christ being the Messiah and the murder that the Jews committed by killing the Son of God and having expressed this and, and told them and confronted them with their um, error and with their sin, which, by the way, is part of our responsibilities uh, done in a kind and gentle way in Galatians 6. But when we confront those who are in error with sin, it's not for the purpose of being haughty. It's not for the purpose of being uh, holier than thou. It's for the purpose of love and the desire for the hearer, just like when I stand before you or any other preacher worth his salt stands before you and encourages you with godly sermons, the, the charge is that if there's something in your life that needs resolving, to repent. Repent. It seems like a harsh thing to tell someone to do. To repent. It, it seems judgmental. It seems um, inflicting uh, things upon them. And it's something that needs to be understood. It's something that needs to be practiced. I'm not amazed, but I'm perplexed at times about, and, and not any one congregation in particular, uh, certainly not this one or not any that I've served at, but I'm perplexed at the, at the um, 
reluctance of those who stand in need of repentance to ask for the prayers of the church. It's something that has always puzzled me. I've always been a go-forward guy. Until I started preaching, it, it's, it's not that I don't need to go forward. I do. I just do a little different way sometimes. But I was a go-forward guy from the time I was my son's ages. Uh, there was a lot of things that I needed to repent for. There was a lot of public sin that I had in my life. And I went forward um, several times a year not bragging or boasting, but it's something that I never had a reluctance to do. But some, it seems, are reluctant to do that, and I'm puzzled by that. One of the features or characteristics of some congregations is that they have a lot of people that go up or a lot of people that go forward, and there's no animosity, there's no pride, there's no, there's no um, fear, there, there are... There's no fear of judgment. There's no, those types of things. And when you have that in a congregation, support, encouragement, no fear of judgment, no pride, it's easier, the door is easier to go through in repentance. And that's the atmosphere that we need to project. Peter, in Acts chapter 3, talks uh, to a crowd preaching from Solomon's porch. And uh, beginning in verse 16, says, And his name, through faith, in his name has made this man strong. He had just healed uh, someone, and he gave the glory to God, gave the, the glory to the power of Christ, the power of the resurrection. He made him strong. Yet now, brethren, verse 17, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that the Christ would suffer, has thus been fulfilled. You see, he snuck in the gospel again. He um, encouraged them that maybe some of the things that they had done, the, the, the sin that they had committed was done through ignorance, done through lack of knowledge. That tells us something, that sins of ignorance need to be repented of. Just because you didn't know it was wrong doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be made right in the sight of God. And verse 19 is the key verse. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You notice there, in that repentance, he said, repent therefore. If they did that, if they repented, these particular people that he's speaking to were not saved, were not baptized, were not members of the church, they weren't saved yet. Repent therefore. And he says, and be converted. The word converted there is a synecdoche. It's a word that stands for another set or group of words. We know of lots of different synecdoches in the Bible. One is believe. If you believe, you'll be saved. Well, certainly the devil's believed and they're not saved, so it can't mean that all you have to do is have a rational thought. It means an action. It means an obedience. It means lots of different things. That's what converted there means. When you convert from one system of faith to another system of faith, there are some things that are mandated that are to be done. And certainly we know the plan of salvation, including believing Jesus is the Son of God, hearing it through the Word of God being preached, confessing Him as the Savior and as the Son of God, and repenting of your sins and being baptized for remission of sins. Through that conversion, He encourages them to be converted. But he says, repent. Why would he tell them that they have to be converted if repentance to the unsaved is all you need to do? It's certainly not all you need to do. He says, repent and be converted. What a challenge to them. When he told, to the, to the folks, when he told them what they needed to do. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed to the entire life of the believer. To be a follower of him and that he should be repenting and turning. James Meadows, uh, a dear brother of the, in the church and legend of the brotherhood and one of the instructors at the school, taught very deeply on repentance, godly sorrow, and uh, we had very strong messages about that and, and a full understanding about the meaning, motivation, and the must of repentance is what we'll talk about tonight. The meaning of repentance. What does it mean when we repent? Is that going up or 
in a public, say for a public manner, is that going forward, is that physical walking to the front of the room and acknowledging something that you have uh, done in error. Maybe you've been caught in, in some crime or maybe it is that um, there's a sin that's become public. And that walking out and walking up and, and asking for forgiveness, does that constitute repentance in and of itself? Well, I would object to that as being conclusive. Certainly, we don't need to judge the hearts of those that come forward. That's, you know, antithetical to what we're talking about tonight. But just because I go up and just because I ask for prayer, the repentance actually begins in your heart. Repentance always includes a change. It always includes a change. A change in all areas of life. Now, some things we have to have help with to change. If you're an addict, if you're, if you're a, some, somebody who has a, an addiction and needs medical help or, or psychological help, that's certainly true. But we know that repentance is a change. It just don't ask to be forgiven. You change your actions. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, in the 1 John 1, 7 is a present active verb. It's a continual acting verb and we need to be changed in Matthew chapter 21 um, verse 28 and 29 this is in the context of the parable of the two sons the, the master or father had two sons verse 28 and to the first he said son go work today in my vineyard he told his son what to do and he answered and said I will not I will not. I wonder what that father looked like. I wonder what his face looked like. I, it doesn't say. There's no voice inflection there. But he says, I need you to go work in my vineyard. And his son did not obey his parent. That was sinful. He said, I will not. But look at the very next sentence or part of the sentence in 29. But afterward, he regretted and went. He had a change of heart. He, he realized his wrong. He, he, now, there's a longer story there, of course, but that change, that regret, that change of mind is something that we need to do. When we repent, we not only need to be, oh, man, I'm caught. I better go up. I better make acknowledgement of my sin. Certainly, that's part of it, but we need to be sorrowful. We need to, the meaning of repentance is found in that word. He regretted it. He was sorry for it. That expresses godly sorrow. There's another section of scripture in Luke chapter 15 that addresses the idea of repentance. The prodigal son. Long passage. Lots of sermons in there. A very simple point can be taken from some of the verses. The prodigal son chose to waste his inheritance on riotous living, the, the worst nightmare of a parent, right? A, a faithful child that falls away and goes the ways of Jeroboam, goes and, and wastes his inheritance. There's really nothing that you can do after they're a certain age. But the, but the phrase that we find in this um, section of Scripture in verse 17 is very powerful and very meaningful. And it, it defines the, partially the meaning of repentance. Starting in 16, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him any. It got pretty rough for the guy. In verse 17, but when he came to himself, there, there's an essence in repentance of coming to yourself. There's an essence of repentance in repentance of regret. There's an essence in the meaning of repentance of realizing where you are in life and that you need to change until you decide that you are in the wrong and that you need to change repentance in a public fashion is no more than going up and walking and sitting down and going through the motions if there's not the coming to yourself if there's not the regret if there's not the sorrow it's not repentance at all. That's the meaning of 
repentance. What motivates us to repent? Why even do it? Well, we studied this morning in Acts chapter 8, one of the better passages in Scripture about repentance. Simon, the Christian, had converted from sorcery and being a magician. And he was tempted when he saw the ability of the apostles to transfer miraculous works of the Holy Spirit. That was appealing to him. He had probably had to give up his magician work when he became a Christian. And the temptation there for money, I'd say, was part of what caused him to ask, hey, let me buy this from you. Well, that greed, I guess you would say, or that motivation, uh, that um, um, uh, purpose that he had for that was sinful. And Peter called him out and, and said, you have no part in what we're doing. You have no part in this matter. The apostles have the part of transferring the spiritual gifts, not you. And the fact that you want to profit from it goes against God's word. And he tells him to repent, to be saved. If we are a, and Simon was a Christian, if you back up to verse 12, it's easy to, to uh, look at in Acts chapter 8. He was converted. He believed he was baptized. There's no reason to believe that he wasn't saved and a Christian. He was really saved. And then he was really lost after something he thought in his heart. The motivation to repent is to be saved if you're a Christian. And it's driven by godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 9 through 10. We look at Paul writing to the church at Corinth. This is his second letter and it's a follow-up letter. Do you remember in uh, 1 Corinthians all the problems? Division, chapter 1 verse 10. They were divided. They were uh, divided amongst themselves, which was sinful. You go on and you get specifically what the reference is here to chapter 5 in 1 Corinthians about the man who was sleeping with his father's wife. And that was a problem. And he talked about casting them out of the church and practicing church discipline. It's evident by this passage that they did that and that it worked and that, the, that it produced godly sorrow. Verse, se, or verse 9 in 2 Corinthians 7 now I rejoice that you were made sorry, but, no, I'm sorry, I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Folks, Godly sorrow, that letter that he wrote, instructing them what to do, had to be a difficult letter. It had to be difficult for the leaders at the church at Corinth to exercise that, that thing that they had to do with discipline. But it worked. And, and he encourages them and says, I'm glad that you're godly sorry. You were sorry for what you did, and it led to salvation. Folks, if we dismiss the need for repentance among ourselves we're going to be lost because unrepented sin when the Lord comes back it's too late when the Lord comes back it's too late unconfessed unrepented unrepented sin will cause you to lose your soul that's the motivation is salvation. Peter said, be saved. Peter said, repent. Be converted. He told Simon, repent so that these things don't happen to you. Repent and pray, he says, that the Lord will save you from these things. God's goodness is shown in Romans 2, 4 in repentance. God's long suffering is shown in repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. And God's judgment, Acts 17, is a passage that uh, we'll look at quickly. God's judgment is a motivation for repentance. I want to be judged based on the blood of Christ. And if we confess our sins, he is willing to forgive. 
The converse of that is if we don't confess our sins, he's not going to forgive. And if we walk in the light, the blood continually cleanses us. When we get to judgment day, if there is, are things that are unrepented, that you're not godly sorrow for, that you haven't reconciled, that'll be a bad day. Acts 17, verse 29, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, remember the family of God we talked about this morning, remember being the offspring of God, the children of God, in the family of God, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not think that the divine nature of God is like gold or silver or stone, something that can be shaped by art of man's hand. Athens had an idolatry problem. They had idols everywhere. And his encouragement, Paul's encouragement to Athens, that they needed to repent from it. Not just stop, not just stop doing it. Of course, that's good to do. Stop your sin. But repent, he says. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, verse 30, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. I love the sermons on the resurrection. It's the power. It's the evidence. It's, the, it's everything is driven by the resurrection. And he proved that judgment will come. He proved that there's a need to repent. That's our motivation. Judgment, salvation. And finally, it's a must. It's a must. It's not a, well, maybe I can slide. I see the look in people's eyes sometimes when they ask about whether or not this is something that they need to repent of. You know what I tell them? If you're asking me that, it's probably something you need to repent. Now, if it's private and public, we have that discussion. But it is a must. God commands it now. That verse we just read. Before he overlooked it, but now commands everyone to repent. And God's commands, we know, are non-negotiable. I'm more than any that I know. I can't speak for you. No, I know for myself the fear, anxiety, pride, issues, things that stand in the way of repentance. I, I've often joked with myself and others that I've had one foot in the aisle more times than, than you know. Let's re remove the stigma of coming and asking for prayer. Let's remove the stigma of being too proud to confess a problem or something that you have in your life. It doesn't always have to be in a public forum. You can go to an elder. You can go to the preacher. A lot of times people don't like to come to the preacher. It's like going to the principal's office. I understand that. You can go to a friend. We're koinonia. We're knit together. We're fellowship. I can go to anybody in this room I, without question and talk about something private if I need to. If you rob a bank, if you besmirch the church, if your sin is public and well-known and in three or four newspapers, if it's something that needs to be handled in a public manner, repent. It, it's something that needs to be resolved, and you are just as lost when it's unresolved as before you were baptized and saved. The idea of repentance is something that we need to study and understand. Tonight, you're given an opportunity. Of course, the, the invitation stands 24-7. And repenting can be as simple as Peter told Simon. Repent and pray that God forgives you. If that's something you need to do tonight, if there's something in your life, if there's some unresolved matter. Maybe it is that you don't even know how to deal with it. But the prayers of church, it's puzzled me why people don't want prayers of the church. That's always, that's pride, I can tell you, most of the time. Fear of how people are going to react. Folks, repent and be converted. Convert. If you've not obeyed the gospel, 
rely on the blood of Christ to wash your sins away, faith, through faith and obedience to his word. And let's be a repent-oriented congregation and encourage each other. Brother Matt's going to come and lead us. If you need to be responding, be coming up forward while we stand. On behalf of the Lawnville Road Church of Christ, I want to thank you for joining us today for our worship. If you ever have an opportunity, we invite you to join us at our physical location at 1301 Lawnville Road in Kingston, Tennessee. We hope you will come experience the simplicity of New Testament Christianity, learn about God, and become a part of His family. If you have questions, if you would like to know more about the Bible, or if you would like a home Bible study, feel free to contact us by calling 865-717-0444. Or, for more information, visit our website, www.lawnvilleroadcoc.org. Again, we thank you, and we hope you have a blessed day.